Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, CWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world. What I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal India Quarterly is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.
My name is Jojin Vijon. I'm a research fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs. It's my pleasure to welcome all to join ICW webinar, Responses to COVID-19 and Northeast Asia's Geopolitics. We have a distinguished panel to discuss this important topic. Allow me to briefly introduce the speakers. We have with us Ambassador Deepa Wadwa to chair today's program. Ambassador Wadwa is a retired Indian diplomat who served India's, uh, as India's ambassador to Japan, Qatar, Qatar and Sweden. The panelists for today's discussion are Professor uh, Rajaram Panda. Dr. Panda is a Lok Sabha Research Fellow and member of the Governing Council of ICWA. We also have Professor Vaijendi Raghavan. Professor Raghavan is a Professor of Korean Studies, Korean Language and Culture at the Center for Korean Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. We also have uh, Dr. Sandeep Misra, who is an Associate Professor at the Center for East Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. I will also join the panel. Before handing off the floor to the chair, I have a, I have a house rule announcement to make. The participants can ask questions by logging into chat as guest option at the bottom of the page in front of you. Then type your name and accept, accept the terms and conditions to begin the chat and discussion. Now I request Ambassador Wadwa to kindly conduct the proceedings. Ma'am, please. Thanks so much, John. Um, and welcome to all the panelists. We have a very eminent panel as well as uh, I think um, DG ICWA, Dr. Raghavan, who's here with us today. As we just heard, uh, the subject today is a response to COVID-19 uh, and, it and its effects on the geopolitics of Northeast Asia. Now, interestingly, three of the four countries that we are going to talk about, uh, all of them in geographical proximity of the epicenter, um, as it were, of the pandemic, uh, were also the countries where the first cases were discovered outside China. And I'm talking about Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Um, so these cases were, I think, uh, they, they were discovered as early as uh, January, mid-January. All these three countries took different routes in containing uh, the, the containment initially of the epidemic um, and, and to contain the spread as well as to ensure, uh, take measures to ensure prevention. And what is there is among the three of them and I, is that they were all considered, I think, relatively successful when you look at what happened in other parts of the world. For example, what has happened in Europe or uh, in the US, now in Russia. So they have been, despite these different routes that they took in containing this um, pandemic, they've all been very successful, particularly in two, in two things, in flattening the curve and also uh, relatively low mortality rates. Um, I haven't mentioned North Korea because they're still in denial and they still claim they have no cases. But of course, we do have reports and I'm sure that there have been some cases. And uh, this interesting distraction that we had recently of the disappearance of uh, Kim Jong-un um, uh, for, for about two weeks in April certainly may have a connection or there are, they're just conjectured, has a connection really uh, to the existence of cases in North Korea. Now, why is it initially, I mean, uh, people have thought, why is it that these three countries, um, this, of course, the infection started early, uh, they've been able to contain it well. They've, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons and, you know, our, our, our panelists are going to discuss country by country and we will be able to evaluate the reasons. But one interesting reason that I, uh, that I saw and I thought I should mention is that all three of these countries had exposure in the past to both SARS and MERS. And therefore, perhaps they were always already used to some kind of protocols. And for example, anyone who's lived, certainly me in Japan, you realize how easy it was to see the face masks out the moment you had the first flu season that came. So perhaps it was easier for them to be able to adjust to what was happening in, in the aftermath of the, of the pandemic. Now, um, I'm calling upon uh, the panelists and this process of this webinar. Uh, let's see whether we can evaluate, uh, we hope to evaluate, the policies that were taken by each of these countries in terms of the politics, uh, the, the economic policies um, that they adopted and the economic situation of each of them, 
um, the their relationship with China, because China is really the big, big, big uh, elephant in the room or the dragon next door. And so, how has this affected their relationship with China? And also, how has it uh, affected the relations among themselves as well as the geopolitics of the region? In fact, uh, you hear very often people saying that uh, this pandemic will be a huge game changer in, in all over the world. And some people are speaking. So, um, uh, just to give a few examples of what I'm trying to say is because when you look at how relations have changed and what is how it's affected them domestically, if you look at Japan and Korea, there's a lot of criticism of the leadership in both these countries. And how is that going to play out? I mean, there's a, there are people who say that this fourth term of RBAs may be in jeopardy because he has mishandled uh, the, the, the initial phase, certainly, of this, of this crisis when they went slow for a variety of reasons, which included, I think, President uh, Xi Jinping's imminent visit. Um, there's also been a very interesting sort of side uh, show to this is that there have been calls um, uh, by by some um, uh, you know, in some parties for for a constitutional amendment in Japan. Now, this is something that happens in Japan. I'm sure um, uh, Dr. Panda will talk about it because uh, what they did was in calling for a state of emergency. Prime Minister Abe was requesting people to do certain things because of their constitution that does not permit the state to violate the uh, provisions of. Of, of personal liberty as well as um, uh, right to property. So there's been a debate, do you need a constitutional amendment? So there have been all kinds of uh, you know, offshoots of, of this pandemic. Insofar as economics is concerned, um, one of the things that, of course, all of them have been impacted, each one of them has been impacted in uh, and adversely, without a doubt. Um, and Japan has slipped into recession, as we've just learned last week. Um, another interesting thing that's happened is that the dependence of suddenly these uh, all the uh, countries, and as a matter of fact, very dependent on the on on China, but of, of the three countries, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, uh, the dependence on supply chains uh, from China, and this has made them sort of relook at the relationship. So we are hearing more about reshoring and relocating supply chains. So this has also been something which has come out of this uh, crisis. Um, relations with China, interestingly, you have actually, and you know, um, the Japan-China relation at this point of time, after many years of, you know, they've, they've gone through a bit of a fraught period, that you find a warm warmth at, uh, as this pandemic opens up. And you have a lot of empathy from Japan, which is appreciated by China. Very little open criticism on both sides, and this seems deliberate. Of course, it must have been because might have been because of this uh, visit by uh, that they were expecting by President Xi Jinping. But otherwise, also, I think there has been a special uh, sense of warmth and uh, bonhomie uh, in the relations between the two people, uh, two countries. Um, in the terms of of Taiwan, I think Taiwan China has really exacerbated the fault lines for a variety of reasons. Uh, North Korea, we saw um, Kim Jong actually write a letter, I think, to President Xi Jinping, uh, you know, and and praising what the way they've handled the, the the outbreak in Wuhan and so on, and so so did South Korea. Relations among the countries, again, you find, uh, and, and I'm sure the panelists will go into that, the initial phase, actually, that there was a kind of standoff between uh, Japan and South Korea, because Japan had decided to, you know, to stop the travel of uh, South Koreans to Japan, and, and the uh, South Korean government was quite upset. So there are different, different sort of uh, elements and facets to what has been happening in this part of the world. But I think, you know, one of the countries, and I'd love to really hear from, from uh, uh, Dr. John, an interesting development has been how Taiwan, in a way, has converted this into a kind of geopolitical win. So, of course, we've been all following what has happened recently in the WHO. Uh, you know, there was a lot of sympathy for them, observer status at the, w, um, at the WHA, the Health Assembly. Also, interestingly, um, the way Taiwan handled it, its own uh, sort of uh, you know, diplomacy in helping other countries with medical supplies and so on, has been counter to the narrative of China, which said it's really an authoritarian state that can really take care of, uh, you know, a pandemic like this, and that, uh, you know, that maybe more liberal democratic states, it would be more difficult, but I mean, Taiwan, I think, proved that to the country. So, um, I will now give 
uh, you know, the flaws of the speakers. I just thought there were some strands which seemed to be sort of, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, which seemed to cover all the, this entire region. And uh, let us hope at the end of this that we can understand uh, a little better how this pandemic has exposed the strengths and weaknesses of the countries of this region and contributed or not to the intensification of existing geopolitical strains in the region. Um, I think we've been just, uh, as John just told us, any questions that you have, do send it in. And it'd be good if you can address, uh, you mentioned who these are addressed to so that I can then take it up at the end after we've heard all our speakers. Um, with these words, could I uh, give the floor uh, first to Professor Rajaram Panda? The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Panda. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Indipa uh, Wadwa, uh, <coughs> to ask me to share my views and also <coughs> my understanding about uh, how Japan has been tackling this COVID-19. Uh, to begin with, uh, initially uh, there was a feeling that uh, uh, the uh, most of the Japanese started uh, thinking that this is not a world problem, this is a China problem. But then the slowly uh, it uh, dawned on the Chinese, on, on the on the Japanese uh, government and the people that this is going to be a global problem. So initial response was a bit slow. There was the initial criticism of uh, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, then when things became a little, uh, you know, uh, grey. Uh, as of now, let me let me give you the figure also. As of as of now, uh, the total uh, uh, infected people uh, is about as of yesterday. 20,212, out of which uh, 16, uh, 12, uh, 12,269 have recovered, and the, the death total is 771. So, so, compared to other countries, in terms of uh, percentage of uh, uh, number you, you know, calculate in terms of uh, the total population, it, it might look small, but then it is, it, it is a problem. Now, <coughs> because of this, the the, uh, the government deliberated on the issue and then the, the state of emergency was uh, announced on 7th uh, uh, May. And, 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 and same day also a, 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 an economic stimulus package also was announced by the government. Uh, now, the emergency, uh, the, the, the state of emergency, how it is to be uh, applied or you know, on the implemented in the country uh, such as Japan is a bit different than what actually it happens in other countries. Uh, according to the Japanese law, uh, the, uh, the government has no uh, absolute authority to uh, impose because any violators are exempted from uh, uh, even, even, even paying any penalty. The government can't impose any penalty. The, the, what the best the government can do is to request. And it all depends upon the uh, people. But then the beauty of the Japanese uh, people is they are basically law abiding and if, if a request is made even in the television or in the media people generally tend to uh, uh, follow and obey but that doesn't mean that there was universal kind of you know uh, uh, compliance to this order there are certain violations because this came during uh, around the uh, sakura season and then there were the government actually discouraged people not to go for uh, the sakura viewing but uh, there were images that people did go and there was there are certain cases of violations. Now, this is about the Japanese you know, uh, perception. Uh, the, so far, the economic uh, 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 stimulus package was announced. This was about uh, 993 billion uh, dollar, which is uh, which uh, which was about uh, 20 percent of the uh, country's GDP, which is quite huge. But then the implementation and then the, the way it was uh, actually to be used, there are certain. Uh, 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 controversy and, and for that Abe was criticized heavily. For example, uh, uh, each household were uh, uh, given a cash handout of 300,000 uh, uh, Japanese yen. Uh, on this, there was no universal acceptance by the people because some people started thinking that uh, this money is uh, irrespective of the uh, need of the people. If this amount is given, this will finally uh, end up uh, by some of the people saving, you know, putting the money in the bank. So it is not going to be actually, you know, uh, used. So if the money is not used, then the economy doesn't get stimulated. So because of the controversy, then, sub then subsequently the, uh, the Abe government was uh, forced to uh, announce 
100,000 yen per individual, including foreigners, foreign residents, including students, foreigners uh, residing in Japan, which was a kind of you know, welcome uh, change. And uh, I, in fact, uh, uh, I was in touch with some of the Japanese, I mean, Indian students uh, residing in Japan, and they were quite happy about it. Uh, but this is uh, uh, this is something which was really welcome. Then another very controversial measures uh, and decision which uh, the Abe government took was to distribute two mask face masks, two face cloth masks, masks to all the you know households in Japan. Now this uh, was actually a bit controversial because this was not very effective because uh, the certain about about ten percent of the I can give you the figure also. Uh, 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 anyway, the, uh, about about ten percent of the total mass which was delivered for especially targeting the pregnant women were in, uh, defective and had to be the 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 you know uh, some of the prefectures they returned this uh, uh, mass to the uh, in, in certain government which uh, which was not in very good taste because that uh, that tainted the image of a country which is known for its quality products. So, uh, having said all this, uh, what is Abe's uh, political position in the country? Abe's, so far as Abe's political position is concerned, I think Abe is safe because there is, uh, the opposition is very weak and there is, uh, there is no immediate threat uh, to his uh, position in the office. Now, uh, uh, the, 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 the adverse impact on the economy also came through the postponement and finally in post first initially the government was very insistent that uh, the olympics will be held as for uh, but then finally when uh, uh, a, a situation uh, developed in such a way that the government had to announce that it, had, uh, it is postponed till uh, july next year but as of uh, the uh, if we read this uh, if, we, if we read the covid situation as of today uh, it is still a very big question whether the Olympics can ever be held or you know, finally you know, will be cancelled like, it, like, like it, it has happened in the past uh, also. Uh, the, the economy is already in the recession as uh, um, uh, Ambassador uh, mentioned and all of us know about it. Uh, so the internally actually even though um, Abe is uh, uh, trying his best to you know, uh, attach to this issue, there are certain uh, 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 local domestic situations, which actually constrains his uh, uh, ability to take, uh, you know, bold step uh, uh, so far as uh, 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 combating this COVID is concerned. Now, what what is the you know impact on the uh, uh, since we since we are talking about the geopolitics, what is going to happen about the region? Now, uh, in the uh, stimulus package which uh, Abe has announced, uh, I think it, uh, the the issue of supply chain also was raised. Now that is a major uh, development actually so far as the Japanese uh, are concerned. The government uh, uh, has, uh, uh, and China in the process has uh, uh, slowly started uh, losing the trust of the world. And uh, many of the Japanese uh, and also other companies are, even American companies are now trying to thinking of moving out from, the, uh, uh, from China. And the Japanese government, uh, uh, as uh, Abe, uh, Abe government has allotted already, I think, 22 uh, point uh, some five uh, billion uh, dollars uh, uh, announced, so that the those companies who are willing to relocate their production bases uh, in Japan or outside Japan in Southeast Asian countries and also maybe in, in India, uh, they can uh, uh, that option is available. And out of this 22.5 billion, I think 2.2 billion dollars are uh, uh, available for those who who are who are uh, planning to move out of uh, Japan itself. And here, probably India is a major you know, uh, uh, prospective investment de destination. And uh, a lot of talk is being done in, in Prime Minister also wrote a you know, couple of pieces on this, uh, that we should, uh, whether it is going to be China's laws, can, uh, can China's laws be India's gain? And that is a major uh, point uh, that we are talking about. But even if suppose India is in a position to attract uh, the Japanese companies and also Korean companies and also American companies, even, even some German companies also. Recently, I heard uh, some footwear companies. They are now thinking to ship that 100% their uh, you know their uh, production base to uh, India and somewhere in uh, Agra probably. Agra, I think, 
and which will create uh, about 10,000 jobs. So if uh, this is theoretically all fine, but whether India is in a position to provide the necessary facilities, uh, the, the infrastructure or the requirements which these uh, these, these companies they require uh, is a big question. I think challenge also is used you know, before us. Now, uh, one thing which is not normally mentioned, but uh, and also often ignored, is the consequences on the society, on the people's psychology. Because I have uh, I have read even in India too, like suppose a COVID patient dies, even cremation becomes a uh, big issue. And we have read in Delhi how even in Nigam both uh, there was some you know COVID death case, uh, you know, in the cremation became a big problem. Similarly in Japan too. Japan too, this uh, this has led to some kind of you know the social ostracism, some you know kind of racism. Uh, even uh, I read somewhere that uh, some suspected COVID patient, some women, uh, her house was stoned. So this is something. How do you change the people's thinking, people's perception? Even these online issues, like today, for example, there is a, there is an article which was uh, very eye-catching uh, for me in 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 Statesman from some Tatta, I think, written. He says this online thing that we are even even this confidence that we are doing today, uh, this whole you know nature of uh, our human uh, life is now changing. Now what is going to happen? The education system, the children now. The, uh, they are now you know, missing the, 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 the classroom environment. So they, uh, you know, this is like you know, addicted to the computer. So these kind of things are happening in Japan too. So uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the challenges are huge. And also the, the, in the process of this economic uh, down, downturn, I think the, the, the unemployment rate is also rising very high, unemployment rate. Uh, compared to other countries, it might look small. I think it is about 2.5 percent uh, but now. But then, if this pandemic continues till, say, for example, another, you know, till say uh, September, it might uh, rise up to 3.5. And if it continues till uh, the end of uh, uh, this year, it will it, it will rise even up to 6.7. That is what uh, the you know the newspaper reports. And uh, this means. The loss of huge number of more than millions of jobs. Now, how AP is going to tackle this is a big, you know, good point. So, uh, how much time I have? Yeah. How much time? How much time? Uh, maybe, maybe a couple of minutes more. Okay, okay, okay. So, so these are all things that I would like to say. I mean, uh, say, and also about the, the last point that I would like to mention about the geopolitical, you know, uh, the, the impact on the geopolitics, which is, uh, uh, because China is a big player in the region, that is not. Let us not discount that. And uh, we are all, you know, the Chinese economy is so much uh, in an interdependent, uh, you know, economically interdependent world. Chinese economy is intrinsically, you know, connected with the linked with many of the countries, including India too. So, uh, and also China's, uh, you know, the aggressive behavior. All of us we know. Uh, even uh, even in the midst of uh, combating such a huge uh, global um, issue. We are now uh, reading news about Chinese uh, naval vessels uh, intruding into the, you know, the uh, the uh, controversial, you know, economic uh, uh, material waters of uh, countries in, in, you know, neighboring in South China Sea, uh, like Malaysia and Vietnam, like that, and also, you know, border problem with uh, India too. So at the same time, whether uh, even uh, even if our government is trying to encourage. Uh, uh, are trying to, you know, entice the, I mean, uh, encourage the Japanese companies to relocate their production buses. Can uh, and also the Chinese, uh, China, Japan, the territorial issue on the over the Senkaku. Uh, uh, will it not hurt too much if uh, uh, either of the countries, uh, or especially in Japan case, takes the, uh, very drastic measures to underplay or maybe, you know, uh, uh, cut down the economic engagement because the the, if you see the composition of trade, it, it is actually quite huge. So neither of the two, neither uh, would like to actually undo the economic advantages which actually accrued uh, from uh, this relationship and this kind of economic partnership. So I think it is quite complicated. With North Korea, of course, uh, that is a difficult country, we, very difficult to understand. With uh, South Korea, the, uh, uh, and also you mentioned about the, the chair mentioned about the, uh, the, the constitutional uh, you know, change, you know, uh, uh, aspiration of uh, Prime Minister Abe. I think for the time being, that is now kept pending. 
I don't think this is the appropriate right time for RBI to even talk about it because the uh, as such, uh, one of us know that the the Japanese people are uh, the, the anti nuclear sentiment is huge and uh, in Japan and the uh, constitution is according to me to my understanding of over you know, four decades or so it is not going to uh, happen because that is a long term aspiration of Abe that uh, you know Article Nine will be amended. I don't think we'll be able to do that because there are constitutional uh, hurdles. Ninety six has to be first uh, amended for touching nine, Article Nine. Article Nine, and given the you know strong national anti nuclear sentiment people, it will not pass the you know the referendum, national referendum. So I think for the time being, the challenge is to cope and combat how to control this pandemic and other and, and also the how to revive the economy employment these are all generation you know employment generations and i think the uh, constitutional issue will be probably kept pending for a while thank you very much i think i will end here thank you thank you very much uh, dr panda particularly for really flagging the issue of the social consequences of the pandemic within japan um, I would now like to call upon Professor uh, Vajenti Raghavan and we look forward to hearing from you about how South Korea has been handling this pandemic. Over to you, Vajenti. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Vadva, for uh, chairing and moderating this session. Uh, I'd like to thank Georgian John for putting together this uh, webinar and ICWA for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, I was asked to cover the region, as you rightly said, South Korea. And as I think I'm given 10 minutes, and there are two aspects that um, I would be covering. One is um, how has the pandemic uh, exposed South Korea's strengths um, more than the weaknesses? I think there are very few weaknesses that uh, we see in South Korea, the way they've handled it. And secondly, uh, how has this... Uh, uh, pandemic or the situation surrounding it uh, affected their geopolitical uh, relationship and put strains and compulsions on them. So, um, so with the first aspect of it, of South Korea handling the pandemic, as all of us must have heard, it's been exemplary. They have become a role model, so to say, of the way they've, uh, they've handled it. And without lockdown, mind you, there was just no lockdown in South Korea. And uh, so how did they do it? A, best practices, best facilities, more than anything else, quick response. But before we I go into that, I'd first just give you a timeline of how things panned out. The first case was discovered on the 20th of January, 2020, the same day that USA discovered their first case. And uh, the cases uh, kept rising through early February. They kept spiking. It became the second most infected country after China. But uh, it peaked on the February or tw of 29th February with 909 cases. And uh, but it took them after that. They were very quick. It took them only six weeks since they discovered the first one. 20th of January it took them only six weeks to flatten the curve. And within three and a half months, that is by mid-April, they had brought down the new cases to single digit level. And all this, during this entire period, there was no panic and there was no lockdown. And so, uh, and the deaths, I'll give you the numbers, the total cases, of course, there's been a resurgence now. It's largely because of community spread. In, Earlier, the community spread that happened in February or was because of a church, Chinchanji, where uh, it, there's a kind of a cult following. So those people hid it that they were infected. They would go, they went to hospitals and they went to downtown um, shopping, departmental stores and spread. That's how it spread. And they quickly contained that. And this time it's because of some youngsters visiting uh, night bars in Ithaewon, which is a very popular place. So the, uh, now they're trying to track and uh, uh, bring down, and I'm sure they'll be able to contain uh, this second uh, resurgence as well, very well. Um, there have been in all only about 11,122 cases as of today uh, of infected cases and uh, only 263 deaths. 
uh, till they were able to confine it. How? Now, I would like to start with the quick response that the, uh, that the, that the Moon government um, undertook. Within a week of getting to know that their first case being discovered, he called 40 uh, medical and pharmaceutical officials for a meeting. This was the time, that is uh, end of January. It was the time when they were having the lunar uh, New Year period and everybody was on a holiday. And, you know, even so he called them and they had a, they held a meeting in the railway station waiting room, if you please, of 40 people. Why? Because he wanted uh, to launch the production of the test kits. So uh, they were sent out to go and produce these test kits. And within two weeks of that, they had produced enough test kits. Um, the government had approved the test kits and distributed them. And as far as quality is concerned in South Korea, you can be sure that, uh, you know, medical equipment at least is really very good. They stand ninth in the global health index, so to say. So, um, and these kits were such that they could give you results within six hours. So the government then opened out 600 of these testing centers, of which uh, 70 were the ones where you can drive through. You know, you went in your car, you drove through, they tested, and uh, the person just drove back home and waited for the result within six hours. And there were other places where uh, you just walked in, got yourself tested within minutes and went back, and the results were there. So that was uh, one, and good facilities, of course, that they had medical facilities, uh, uh, everything. Yeah, they drew from a lot of their experience during uh, the uh, MERS uh, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome in 2015 and SARS before that 2003. So they drew on these experiences and they stocked up with stuff, with their PPEs, with their uh, ventilators, with all that. So um, they, they, they're very thorough, I, I would say, but, you know, they're very thorough in whatever they do and they learn from their mistakes and uh, because the government faced a lot of flack uh, during the MERS uh, thing because a, uh, people didn't know what was happening and there was no way of communicating to them the numbers or anything like that. So now then they made a change in the legislation where, uh, whereby, uh, you know, now this time around, they used their ICT in the best possible way of tracking, informing, and, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, quarantining the affected uh, persons. So there was this app. And in India, we worry about, uh, you know, trespassing the privacy of a person and things like that. In Korea, also these apps, but then they had the option of um, not revealing their names or their age if they didn't want to. Uh, so it was just an app that everybody had to download so that when the test results came and whoever tested positive, it was able to inform everybody about the vicinity, meaning where the nearest person, affected person was. So there was social distancing without a really actually, uh, you know, uh, it, enforcing it by the government, meaning people. Uh, and that's another thing which I'd like to say that the society and the culture is such that, you know, there's a lot of uh, mm, social cohesion over there. They, they believe a lot in community harmony. So the individual happiness, uh, you know, community harmony supersedes individual happiness. They would never want to fulfill their desire and go out and jeopardizing somebody else in the bargain. You know, they're not thinking of themselves, oh, if I go out, I might get infected. But they are thinking first about, oh, will I be jeopardizing somebody else? So that is a very strong feeling amongst the South Koreans. So that is one thing about their society, with uh, which is I think, and uh, then of course the medical facilities help them. The ICT. They said when you the, uh, uh, South Korean officials said that the three T's that uh, helped them was the testing, tracking, and treating. All these three, they're their strong points. So uh, once they tested, then they tracked the patient, the infected patient, informed everybody through their apps and through their mobile phone. They have the best ba bandwidth and the best uh, connectivity and so and the best apps. Uh, so they informed, 
And then it was uh, then the treatment. It was the best treatment that they could give. So that is, these were the general things. Um, and in the midst of this, they conducted a parliamentary election, if you please. Only country that conducted uh, uh, their 21st parliamentary election on the 15th of April so successfully. Uh, but before I come to the parliamentary uh, election bit, like it's not as though the government did not face uh, flack during criticism during the pandemic. They did. For what? Because they did not close the borders with China. They didn't even other countries. We did various countries, considering the geographical proximity of South Korea, they did not close the borders. And so the general public was asking what's going on, meaning everybody is shutting their borders and you have people coming from Wuhan. The first case was a Chinese from Wuhan who brought it. Then it was the South Korean from Wuhan who came and sort of, you know, that was. So they said, why aren't you shutting? And the government had later on, they revealed the reasons. But at that point, the government didn't sort of cave into uh, the demands by the public. It just went on with their policy, what they thought their borders. They were criticized also for the fact that when there was a shortage of masks in the local market, they were uh, sending to China. They were sending um, quarantine equipments to China and with this, uh, with, with uh, uh, you know, those, uh, uh, the, the labels saying China fighting, Wuhan fighting, They're, the fighting is a way of a motivation for people to see through uh, difficult times. That's it's a way of encouraging somebody. So the, the package would say China fighting, Wuhan fighting. So the public was saying we are short of masks and how is it that you're sending it away? But they were confident that more masks will come and they'd be able to handle the situation at home. And um, so the, the elections again was conducted beautifully by the National Ele uh, Election Commission, uh, which along with the uh, chief of the contagious diseases, uh, the uh, person heading that department of contagious diseases, together they were able to conduct the elections. Largest turnout uh, since, I don't know how many, since 92 elections, I think the largest turnout of 66% uh, of uh, the voters came and voted. And Moon Jains, the, the incumbent uh, uh, president's party, Democratic Party, won hands down. It's a sweeping victory of 180 of a 300 seat in the parliament they won. That again is the largest victory, I think, uh, since 1987. So um, before the elections, the issues were slow growth, economic based, slow growth, unemployment, those were the issues. But the way he handled this pandemic saw his rating really go up and he, he, he really won, did an exemplary job. So um, uh, that is the aspect of the pandemic. Now quickly I'll go through the geopolitical constraints and compulsions that it faces. When we talk about South Korea, one has to be aware of his positioning. It's in a place where you know the interests of these big powers they all uh, tend to whether they clash converge whatever it is at that juncture it is at that crossroads and therefore the strains of this china us relations really affects it a lot china is its greatest economic partner and us its greatest strategic ally and uh, one one Sometimes wonders, meaning these two, can't they be kept aside and, you know, worked out, relationships worked out in, and, and not put a strain on uh, uh, countries like Korea, which are caught in this, because after all, uh, the economy has to go on and proximity of the place and the investments coming in from China and uh, things like that. So, uh, it should be I think possible. Can we just, uh, if you can end quickly, because I think running slowly, a little out of time. Oh, really? Sorry. Okay, I'll quickly, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, China, uh, it, it, with China, it did not shut the borders. And uh, uh, the reason they are saying is pandemic is short-lived, whereas our uh, bilateral relations are enduring. We've got to keep an eye on that. 
And vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan, of course, the uh, relationship was strained right from the beginning. Uh, from 2018 October, when the Supreme Court passed the order that they had to pay compensation, it was bad. And this time, the pandemic, uh, well, Abe said, well, that was no big deal the way they handled it. That was his initial comments. And so South Korea said, okay, then we are not sending you any masks. Not that he was asking for it either. So, uh, retaliation, counter retaliation, their relationship and the supply chains were affected. Uh, Japan uh, really sort of, you know, cut the supply chain. Then uh, about uh, the USA could have benefited so much from uh, their experience. Their biggest ally is South Korea. Their pandemic experience, they could have. But Trump was probably, you know, underestimating the, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, the, the, um, the effect of the pandemic, he did not uh, seek help, he did not reach out, and nor did South Korea. But then they did send testing kits on the 14th of April, they sent about 6 lakh testing kits. Um, so these are the way it is, meaning with each country, um, it has its own uh, problems. But uh, its economy is very badly hit because it's largely an export-oriented. The government is giving whatever it can by way of stimulus economic stimulus and packages and uh, but it's uh, it's banking on the uh, civic community on people's civic responsibility of the uh, of helping out the people and keeping them engaged and the, sorry to have it, uh, eaten into sandeep's time but thank you yeah Thank you very much. You know, two interesting things is one is, of course, their success was because of the amount of testing that they did. And you said they had the kits in place. And the other, I think, a very interesting point is the fact that they conducted a parliamentary election through all of this. And I think that really is something of great significance. So um, now I'll ask um, uh, Dr. Sandeep Mishra. And everybody really wants to know what's happening in North Korea, because I think that is where we get, uh, they're still in denial and we just, uh, you know, what is the story that, because it's been a distraction while everyone's been busy with the pandemic, this disappearance of Kim Jong-un was a distraction and now we're all waiting to hear what is happening. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, ICWA, for inviting me for this important webinar. And uh, I think uh, it's very uh, interesting uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I had to uh, speak about North Korean response to COVID-19 and changing geopolitics of East Asia. So first thing, when I looked at figure of North Korea in cases, then I realized that if you have to decide that who is superpower, on the basis that how many people, like how many cases are there, because this is also an enemy. In a way, this uh, virus is also an enemy, and how much people are getting affected in a particular country, or say how many people are dying, that's going to be one of the scale to compare that how much capacity a state has. It seems to me that North Korea, if you believe their official figures, they are superpower. They are bigger, super, more important and effective superpower than the United States of America. It's a very interesting, uh, uh, you can say, uh, scenario. Actually, what happened that if you have to look at North Korean COVID-19 cases, the problem is that we don't have any other information. Whatever information we are having, little information, they are from very uh, scattered, some NGOs, some websites, some other, you can say, some North Korean defectors and others. And on the basis of that, be it in China, be it in Japan, be it in South Korea, people make some sense of what's happening in North Korea. So the basic problem when we look at how North Korea responded to COVID-19, we need to start with this basic premise that we don't have information, one. Two, whatever information we are having, they are not quite reliable, actually. They are there, we can help, we can take help from them, but they are not reliable. Because of these two reasons, suppose even if North Korea is officially saying that there's nobody affected by COVID-19, we can't rely on that information. At the same time, there are rumors and others saying that there are lakhs of people in North Korea who are affected, they are dying, but North Korea is not reporting. Probably those information could not be also right. So, in my opinion, what I did to understand North Korean situation, I, I looked at what's happening in North Korea in the last two, three months. And when I look at what's happening in North Korea, I can see that even if there are not reported 
uh, cases in North Korea. If you look at their behavior, you can see that they have been doing certain things which apparently indicates that they do have some problem of COVID-19 in their country also. Uh, for example, suppose, and, and, and actually, in case of North Korea, if they don't have a single case, which is not right, but it's also quite, uh, you can say, likely that they, they don't have many cases. They don't have actually made cases in, say, lakhs or, say, tens of thousands or something. So they have been able to limit spread of COVID-19 in North Korea. And the primary reason, actually, I will say that they started as, uh, say, uh, Taiwan did, as even, uh, say, uh, some other countries also did. They started, can say, reacting quite early. The response was very quick. So suppose in, we must have heard about uh, Chinese New Year, which is celebrated across the East Asia. That was on 25th January. And before that, Actually, 21st, 22nd, 23rd January sometimes, North Korean, they started closing down their border. Border with China, border with Russia. Actually, 26th of January, next day to New Year, they officially closed down their border with China. It's fully closed, actually, after that. And this had led to lots of economic scarcity in North Korea, but they did that. Not only that, on 17th of April, after two months almost, they had another actually uh, round of restrictions of move because actually even if you close China and North Korea border, there have been reports that sometimes smugglers, sometimes you can say some unofficial uh, actors, they they do keep actually having some kind of exchanges between South and uh, say between North Korea and China. So April they said that look any non-essential item is going to be banned from uh, the. China or any other foreign country. Not only that, in March, April, they also started spreading a rumor. Actually, sometimes state in North Korea, they also spread rumor. So they started spreading rumor that, look, anything which is coming from South Korea, America or any foreign country, actually, because many countries, they want to affect COVID-19. Actually, they, they want to send COVID-19 disease in North Korea. So be careful, don't touch that. So I think they started putting lots of ban, they started, and for, uh, about, apart from other things, almost every day, Nodong Sinmu started publishing some information about how to be safe, how to avoid COVID-19. So they, not only that, there were there three or four new channels, they have three or four TV channels. All the channels also, quite regularly, they also started. So basically, if you look at official information which we have, we know that actually from January onwards, very early, you can say, say late January, so quite early in the COVID-19, this whole pandemic uh, uh, pan, they started acting very proactively. They closed their border, they started educating their people, and they used all their resources. Like, I can, I can, I can give you one example, that on 31st July, the Disease Control Authority from Pyongyang, they visited Sinichu, a border city of North Korea, uh, like in, 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 in western side of the west, like northwest border actually. So they started working and that's basically a very important reason why they have been able to. Now the second thing which comes to my mind, this is basically, so this is the, like we known information which we have. Now there are some unknown information which are being speculated by several, like suppose there are two, three sources, four sources, I will say, suppose one is, it's called uh, NK News. There is a, you can say, uh, there is a uh, uh, Rinmin Gang. Rinmin Gang is actually another, you can say, website, which is run by a Japanese and a Korean, actually. But Korean is actually, he has departed, he has started another own Imjin Gang from South Korea. So then Radio Free Asia is there. And uh, there is a daily NK News, daily NK and NK News. There are two different, you can say, website, Radio Free Asia and Rimjin Gang. So overall, these are the four or five sources which are having, suppose Rimjin Gang is very, uh, uh, you can say, they have their uh, citizen, like, citizen reporter actually. They have their 
on-site reporter they call it because what they do that they have some cell phones they send it to North Korea they smuggle it to North Korea somehow they distribute it to people in North Korea and those North Korean people they claim that they inform Rim Jin Gang about information what's happening in North Korea so according to all these sources there are some figures which I will say that as I told you that according to daily North Korea the first death in North Korea from COVID-19 was reported on 27th of January. In February, according again to all these sources, overall there are reports that 7,000 people were quarantined and almost 20 people they died. In March, again one of these sources they told that look, we, they got into some military commission, some report, and according to that report, almost 180 military personnel they died and around 400 you can say 4000 you can say military personnel they will quarantine in april also there are reports that around 20 people in one county of uh, rangyang actually uh, province it's, it's a um, uh, north east side so actually people they uh, died so these are the information which I don't know, you can rely on them, you, you, you may not rely on them, but these are the information which we are having. So it's, it's true that there have been cases in North Korea. Actually, these uh, sources, they also inform that uh, the top, you can say, uh, top, you can say, working, you can say, Korean uh, People's Party, Central Committee members, they were given, they were distributed masks and other things, and they were basically uh, instructed to be careful. So I think all these things support Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un so, was... Yeah, um, so uh, Dr. Mishra, just try and sort of, uh, you know, conclude as soon as you can, because I think we're running out of time a bit. Mm. So Sorry. I'll, I'll conclude in two okay. minutes, yeah. yeah. So I'm saying that these are the information which we have. Now, ultimately, so uh, uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll say that if, if you look at North Korean response, ultimately, I will say that two things are important. One is basically that they acted quite early. Two, I will say that we need to remember that North Korea is a totalitarian state. So every citizen is very well accounted there. And they have reached, the state is so penetrative that they have reached up to the last man. So immediately they can do that. Maybe because of these reasons, even if they are having cases, they may not be having so many cases. Now, ultimately, geopolitical context, I will say that, look, they have been cooperating, they have been dealing with China, like say, uh, there's some economic... Uh, disconnect between China and North Korea because of this crisis. But I think May Kim Jong Un he wrote a letter to Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping responded that verbally, though not you can say formally, but verbally he responded. Both the countries they appreciated each other. And meanwhile, North Korea had also four missile tests in March actually. First in March, mid March, and then 27th, 29th March. Uh, overall, Kim Jong Un had been away also for some time. It seems to me that North Korea at this point of time, they are looking very closely at what's happening in Northeast Asia. When they look that when Japan and China had been co they have been cooperating on COVID-19 uh, crisis, when South Korea and China, they are having some understanding to have quick tour of business person from one country to another country, North Korea feels that they need to be, be in loop. They need to be careful because if... Suppose China is able to inculcate some good trustworthy relationship with Japan and South Korea and in case North Korea is left out, that would not be a very good proposition. I think overall it seems to me that North Korean have been look the, the, the North Korean leadership, they have been looking at all these things and I think um, they have been trying to use this opportunity, you can say, use this crisis as opportunity and uh, but still things are still in uh, the doldrum is still actually in, in and and it would be premature to say that how north korea is going to uh, place itself in geopolitics of east asia in future so i will end here in question answer i will I'll further take up thank you thank you thank you uh, dr mishra very interesting particularly when you say that the tv channels have been talking about uh, covid 19 so obviously that makes it quite clear and that is the national TV channels that uh, they must have been, uh, there may have been cases and you are talking about, uh, you know, reports of cases um, in, in uh, which started pretty early. Uh, well, thank you so much. And now over to uh, Dr. John, who will tell us about Taiwan. Again, this has been really very, very uh, 
interesting the whole experience that uh, or, or rather the, um, you know, the effect of the pandemic on Taiwan not only as a country but also on the world stage so we look forward to hearing from you thank you uh, thank you ma'am I hope I'm audible um, good afternoon everyone in my brief remarks I will focus on Taiwan's response to COVID-19 and the geopolitical implication of the uh, uh, that the crisis has brought about in the region from the Taiwanese perspective. Like many other East Asian countries, Taiwan was also exposed to the pandemic very early. Taiwan reported its first case on, on January 20th. Uh, given the proximity and the thick interaction with mainland, uh, many of the epidem many epidemiologists initially expected that uh, Taiwan could become a major hotspot uh, outside uh, the mainland. So, however, it turns out to be the case otherwise. Um, well, let me give you a brief sense, uh, a sense of the situation of COVID situation in, in Taiwan. Um, uh, Taiwan, as of May 20th, reported um, about 440 confirmed cases uh, with uh, seven uh, fatalities. Out of these 400, uh, 440 cases, about 440 people have uh, 400 people have recovered, um, and and most of these cases that have been uh, reported in Taiwan are mostly imported cases, uh, which also indicates that there has been very minimal. Uh, I mean, th there was actually no uh, cluster or uh, community uh, infection in Taiwan. For the last 13 years, uh, 13 days, there has been no new cases of infection have reported. And the Taiwan's response to COVID-19 uh, crisis has received much attention uh, internationally and widely acknowledged as a model to follow because of the success in terms of containing the epidemic, uh, but uh, most importantly, pre preempting the, epi uh, the, uh, the epidemic um, with um, a very minimal loss of life and minimal burden on it on on the the health system and most importantly uh, without costing much uh, social damage or economic damage uh, the public life of uh, public life and economic activities in taiwan remained almost normal and for the last uh, uh, for the last three four months uh, unlike the tough measures adopted by governments elsewhere the Taipei response showed how smartly one can deal with a crisis of such a magnitude without compromising the democratic principle and social order. So, um, in addition to having an advanced health system, uh, uh, Taiwan is, is considered to be one of the, the best healthcare uh, system in the world. Uh, I think there are four important aspects that stands out in, in uh, Taipei's COVID strategy. And much of this has uh, much of these um, were built on the Taipei's experience of dealing with the 2003 SARS crisis. Um, well, <coughs> the first is the early recognition of the crisis and the quick response. The second is uh, the preparedness. The Taip uh, Taipei, compared to many other uh, countries, was well prepared enough to deal with this kind of a, uh, epidemic. And they had a system in place. And uh, the third aspect is the smart governance, uh, in which the, uh, uh, Taipei had a, um, had a, they applied the advanced technologies like artificial intelligence and big data to deal with the crisis. And the fourth, I think, is the effective communication, uh, which helped Taipei to maintain the authorities in Taiwan to maintain trust between the government and the people in, in times of this crisis. Let me elaborate a little bit briefly about each of these points. <clears throat> uh, an important factor that underpinned Taipei's, uh, Taipei's uh, successful response was its early recognition of the crisis. Uh, Taipei's alert, alertness and the deep knowledge of, of the developments in mainland China is, is, is an important aspect that needs to be looked at uh, here. Um, and perhaps no other country has such a deep understanding of the Chinese society and as, uh, because of its close linkages and also the, uh, they share the uh, same cultural um, context. Um, towards the late, late December, the authorities in Taipei was already on alert about the strange case of pneumonia that was uh, fast spreading in Wuhan. 
after picking up information mainly from Chinese social media. On December 31st, the Taiwanese health officials began screening uh, flights arriving from Wuhan. Uh, looking, they, they were not exactly sure what, the, what was the nature of this epidemic uh, or the, the infection. So what, uh, they were looking for flu-like symptoms. And they were isolating these people and quarantining them. On the same day itself, Taipei also alerted WHO about the possibility of the human to human transfer of the infection, which later on became a much important contested point between WHO and, the, uh, and Taiwan and the international community, which I'll talk a little later. Uh, the Taipei also sent a medical team to Wuhan in the first half of January to understand the situation which was fast developing there. So, uh, and which it helped Taiwan, Taiwan to to make sense of the situation which was emerging in China. Uh, eventually, <laughs> Taipei banned all flights, uh, flights from Wuhan on January 23rd and uh, first stopped the uh, flights from Wuhan on January 23rd and then the flights from all of China on, on uh, February 4th. Uh, and and, and the, on, this, on the second aspect, the Taiwan was much prepared compared to many of the countries around the world in dealing with this kind of crisis. And, uh, and they l learned this uh, ex uh, lesson from the, the, uh, the, the crisis that they faced in 2003, the, 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 the SARS crisis. Um, uh, recognizing the urgency of the situation on, on, uh, that was developing in the uh, mainland China, Taiwan activated the Central Epidemic Command Center, which is like the, uh, the, uh, the a unifying command center with the health minister as the commander to deal with the whole situations. And this actually was uh, established in 2004, uh, 2004 after the SARS epidemic. And they, the, the uh, Taiwanese authorities been doing a lot of uh, mock drills and simulations on uh, uh, to face eventualities of this kind. And uh, once it was activated, the CEC has rapidly produced and implemented more than 130 actions in the in, in the course of um, two weeks time, including the border control from sea and uh, air, or case identification, quarantine of uh, or quarantine of suspicious cases, uh, the proactive finding. So a whole range of issues uh, they've been active in, in such a uh, short time, in, in at least in two weeks. And the, uh, this command center also took the active role in resource allocation to ensure the availability of essential medical items like the masks and sanitizers and the protective gowns for the medical uh, personality, uh, persons who are dealing with the COVID uh, situation and the Taiwan government also banned the export essential, uh, exports of essential medical supplies and set the prices to avoid panic and hoarding and use government and military resources to increase the production and capacity of medical supplies. Uh, I th uh, well, on, on the third aspect, uh, and, and this is something which uh, Taiwan also shares with the uh, similar experience that the, the South Koreans uh, response to COVID, uh, it's about the use of technology and in a way uh, smartly dealing with the, uh, the, these kinds of crises. Uh, from the very old, early on, Taiwan leveraged the use of um, advanced technology like uh, artificial intelligence and big data analysis for the identification and surveillance of infection, infected person, uh, patients and people who are at risk by mainly integrating two databases, the, the national health uh, database and also the immigration and custom database, uh, which helped the Taiwanese government or the authorities to, to identify people who are at risk because of their travel history and informing the hospitals. And in fact, actually, the, uh, the Taiwanese authorities have integrated the health and the immigration data and shared with the hospitals, clinics and pharmacies and, and, and in a way, a, a sort of uh, streamlined um, the surveillance system and also um, uh, they were able to identify wh whom should be prioritized in terms of testing, uh, whom should be quarantined, and whom should be given a uh, given medical uh, uh, attendance. 
So, and they also use the mobile uh, data to monitor people, whether they are following uh, people who are under quarantine or people who are at high risk because of their travel history. And the fourth thing I think is the effective communication. Uh, apart from daily briefing the health minister, uh, the, the vice president of uh, Taiwan, who himself is an epidemiologist and who has an experience uh, dealing, uh, who has actually led the Taiwanese <coughs> The to the 2003 uh, SARS crisis, led a public information campaign uh, from the president's office. And this open and transparent communication helped Taiwanese authorities to earn the trust of the people and avoid social, uh, the, avoid panic in the society. Well, as, as the chair mentioned, one of the, uh, the things that comes out of this crisis is the, uh, the, the soft power aspect uh, that Taiwan gained in this whole crisis, particularly the, um, uh, the, the visibility that it has gained in the international uh, community, because, particularly because of its uh, early containment of the virus, and also an innovative health diplomacy that the Taiwan has undertaken. And, mm, uh, particularly by medical aid and also the uh, the Taiwan the role that the Taiwan uh, played in terms of the uh, the issues associated with uh, WHO and um, also contesting Chinese narratives of the virus uh, the vir uh, the the origin of the virus uh, and also uh, the information cover and and they also organize a massive information uh, public relations campaign under the banner Taiwan can help and I, I think uh, it's interesting to look at the campaign uh, that the the Taiwanese civil society organized and one example to to give is the the, uh, the one pa one full page uh, advertisement given in the uh, the New York Times, the front page New York Times, uh, with the title "Taiwan Can Help," uh, to counter the narrative of 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 of, of mainland China, and they also um, undertook a massive medical aid, uh, and particularly their mass uh, mass dis diplomacy has been widely appreciated. They have donated uh, something like 30 million face masks and uh, uh, other medical equipments. And, and it's important to note that much of this public relations campaign was uh, driven mainly by the Taiwanese civil society. Uh, let me now move on to the geopolitical aspect of, of, of the COVID and its implication for Taiwan. Yeah, a little quickly, John, so that we have one or two questions we can take from the audience. Here. Sure. The, while Taipei fared well in its fight against COVID, the geopolitical implication of the, uh, the crisis posed a major challenge to its leadership. We see that uh, what basically what the the COVID crisis has done is to intensify the cross trade relations, which was already under fire since 2016, when uh, the current president Tsai Ing-wen was elected, based, uh, because she uh, represents the the Democratic Pro uh, Progressive Party, which uh, stands for which which um, uh, which pushes the idea of independ uh, Taiwanese independence. So. Uh, in that sense, the last four years has witnessed uh, uh, the Beijing's increasing pressure on tai Taipei uh, through different measures. Uh, one uh, important, uh, particularly in the, uh, uh, curbing Taiwan's international presence. Um, uh, during the last four years, Taiwan uh, lost around six its diplomatic partners. Tai Taiwan now has only uh, been recognized by 15 countries. And another important one, uh, factor, that, uh, point that I want to highlight is uh, this uh, Washington's growing strategic competition with Beijing on the one hand and its deepening relationship with Taipei on the other hand has further strained the cross-strait uh, relations in the recent years. And it appears that at the time of the crisis of increasing US-China tension, the Trump administration's is keen on playing the Taiwan card vis-a-vis -vis China, a series of actions including uh, passing of the Taiwan Travel Act in 2008 and Taipei Act in 2020 is effectively watering down uh, Washington's one China policy. In interestingly, the, I mean, uh, uh, the 
the Taipei Act, which was passed in uh, very re in recent uh, recently, not only seeks to increase the scope of U.S. China U.S. Taiwan relations, but goes on to encourage international organizations and its allies and partners, especially Quad countries, to strengthen its official and unofficial ties with uh, Taipei. Uh, to, uh, to be fair, the cross-site relations was expected to be expected to deteriorate even before the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, given Thai's re-election in, in, in January early this year and her outright rejection of uh, uh, President Xi Jinping's proposal of one country, two system as a model to uh, model for cross-state relations. So in a context where the COVID crisis has further intensified geopolitical pressures in the region and in particular growing nationalist sentiments at home and growing US-China rivalry, the hardline tendencies emerging in, from Beijing uh, the, the, in her second term, uh, the uh, Tsai Ing-wen will, uh, will be faced with an unprecedented challenge. Um, I think I will stop my remarks here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. John. So we've had really some very interesting perspectives. Um, from on, on all these four countries, and I'm sure this has thrown up some uh, new, also, uh, I think, facets of information which we didn't have. I do see that there have been some uh, questions, and I'm just going to pick a few of them because I think we have about 10 minutes left. So let me just start. Uh, let me start with um, Ambassador uh, Suresh Goel. And I think uh, this probably uh, I will um, address it to uh, Dr. Mishra. And he says, and in fact, the two questions are not correct, so I'll try and put them together. And he says, um, how could COVID-19 have entered North Korea considering that human interactions are either from uh, China or from the South Korean side? Um, that is one. The other is Deepika Saraswat asking um, that... Uh, the ha this pandemic has been worse for countries that are more c connected. Uh, so um, in, in the case of uh, North Korea, has the isolation made a difference? So, uh, Dr. Mishra, please. Yeah, thank you. I think both the questions, they are indicating uh, towards the same thing, that since North Korea is largely isolated, they have only connection via China and maybe sometimes via, you can say, from Russia or maybe South Korea, but Russia and South Korea are very, very limited. South Korea, at least sometimes some formal meetings, they do happen, but in last few years, things have been quite, you can say, uh, I think, uh, the like Haesung Industrial Complex that's gone, the Mount Kumgang Tourist Project that's also gone for almost several years. So I think most probably, in my opinion, the virus have, might have come to North Korea via China. Because China was quite affected, so it's a most probable because it's quite easy to uh, say that. And, uh, uh, and being isolated and also, like being isolated, because sometimes, you know, somebody told me that uh, 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 recently he visited uh, Andaman and Nicobar Island. So he told me that uh, there are two uh, tribes there. One is actually Jarawa tribes. Some, some, you know, yeah, Jarawa tribes. Another is sentence. So they said that look, Jarawa sometimes they are connected to Andamani people. So they may have chances of getting COVID-19. But the people sentence who doesn't have any relations at all, so they are safe. So if you are like to be safe if you have if you want to cut off yourself, that's not a very good thing. But anyway, that probably helped not to. So yeah. Thank you so much. Um Another question, I think this is also an interesting question, which is really about uh, Taiwan, uh, Dr. John. And uh, saying, you know, we know what happened at, um, at WHO, where, you know, they couldn't get observer status. But what do you think will happen in the future uh, in this context of, um, of Taiwan seeking a presence in international organizations? Somebody had spoken about how the U.S. is in favor of this. And, uh, you know, could this in uh, any way so, sort of impact uh, other such pandemics that could happen which are of a global nature? So actually, what, what, what will Taiwan continue to uh, seek uh, a position in uh, observer status in international organizations? Will they be backed by U.S.? 
Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, well, one important thing that is to be recognized. I mean, one of the reasons why Taiwan was able to to respond to this crisis in in uh, such a swift and uh, efficiency is mainly because of its international isolation. So it, it yes. developed systems and it built information system in such a way because of its isolation. So it it has it realized that it has to be on, on self help. So so that's one of the important factor one needs to realize. Uh, and the well, of course, we now know that the uh, WHA um, meeting, which held early this week, uh, the Taiwanese uh, observer status uh, matter was not discussed. So it postponed to the the next meeting, which is going to happen sometime later this year. Make answer, we don't know. Uh, but it's interesting to know that you see there seems to be a trade off which happened on in the in the because I mean, well. Uh, it seems to that the international community or the, or the major players were using the Taiwan card in such a way to push China. Uh, well, it, it seems to me, at least to me, so uh, when this was played out uh, as if it try, pushed China using Taiwan card and um, I mean trying to open it for some sort of investigation of of the origin of the uh, the coronavirus and and something of that sort. But I think Taiwan, uh, for that matter, uh, there is a I mean, let's say there is a resurgence of uh, Taiwanese nationalism which pushes the the Taiwanese international presence uh, that has been on, for, though it has been on for, for quite some time, but uh, that has been accelerated in the context of the recent crisis. But uh, that being said, but uh, the opportunity for Taiwan to, to to get access to international, uh, the, uh, it's it's all membership in international. It seems to be quite uh, squeezed at this point of time, given the the role, the hardline position that the China takes. Yeah, thank you. I know because it's not going to be easy, though. As you know, they did have observer status for some years before this uh, government of Tsai Ing-wen came in. Um, the next question is, I think I'm going to ask both um, uh, Dr. Raghavan and Dr. Panda to, to, re uh, to respond to this. And this will be the last. I think both of you, if you could just round this off. And this is basically to say, um, do you see that this pandemic has opened new avenues for closer relations between China and Japan on one hand and China and Korea on one hand? And this is kind of a deliberate strategy as kind of uh, China-US relations deteriorate. So uh, is this something that we're going to see? So first, uh, Dr. Raghavan, please. Thank you. Um, yes, meaning it's always welcome. The regional countries need to have better relationship, especially this region. Uh, each one, the bilateral relationship is very marked. It's by their various um, other things that you know, non, uh, non-political also, and it sort of trickles into, uh, non-strategic uh, 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 avenues as well. So it's good that China and Japan are at least beginning to, um, uh, cooperate. And, uh, China and Korea, well, China independently has very good relations, economic relations with South Korea, and it has very good relations, of course, with North Korea, only ally that uh, North Korea has. So, um, it would uh, it would greatly benefit the region if this pans out where uh, uh, this would uh, bring all the countries closer together. But I don't see that particularly happening between China and Japan, uh, especially when uh, the U.S. has Japan as its strongest ally, uh, as one of its strong allies. It won't give up its maritime hold there. So Japan can cooperate to an extent with China. But beyond that, I think there is a limit to how much it can do, especially when it's still aligned with uh, the US. Uh, so there are limitations there. And uh, Raj, uh, Dr. Panda can add some more. Yeah, on Japan, certainly. Let's hear from you, Dr. Panda. You'll have to, uh, you'll have to unmute. We can't hear you. You'll have to unmute, I think. Thank you. You'll have to unmute. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. No, no, no. 
No, Dr. Panda, could you try? Could you try and unmute, please? Not here. I'm afraid we are not able to hear Dr. Panda. I think we have some problems uh, with the sound. Could you try again, Dr. Panda? Could you try to just unmute? No, I think he's trying and it's not really working. But I think um, since we are running out of time, unfortunately, I think we'll have to end this here. And um, just I will, I, I, there's not much summing up that I need to do, but just to say, Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for a very informative and interesting discussion. And um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, in, in the course of this, a lot of people who were here have learned a lot of lesser known aspects about this region. Thank you again. Thank you, um, uh, DGICWA, for this opportunity and uh, John for coordinating it. Over Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. We can hear Dr. Panda now. Can we hear him now? Okay. Dr. Panda, can you, you're unmuted, no, you're, I think there's a microphone. Okay. There's so a microphone need. problem, I think. Thank you. Thank you. John, I think, would you, um, John, you John, unmute, John, John, you John, unmute. Here. John, unmute, John, you'll have to unmute too. Am I audible now? Yes. yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, I think Dr. Panda, you try again uh, without touching your mic. I have, I, I have been trying continuously. Yeah. Now we can hear you very well. Yes, we're listening to you. Yes. I am clicking several times, but he is not. Uh, now we can hear you. Now we click. can hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Now, is it okay now? Very much. Okay. Yes, please, uh, please do respond. Okay, uh, I was just uh, mentioning about uh, the relationship between the you know uh, these countries in Northeast Asia. Uh, uh, there, are, there are actually two di two different dimensions. I would look at it. Uh, one is uh, the strategic and uh, the uh, the security aspects, and another is the economic aspect. Now, each country, like like for example, let's go to Japan China relationship. As I said in my presentation also, uh, economically both the countries are going very good. But then the, the, at the at the political level, there are problems. Even uh, actually things are moving uh, in the right direction because uh, President Xi Jinping was uh, you know, scheduled to visit uh, Japan after, after, after so many years in uh, April. That had to be uh, cancelled and because of the COVID and all. So uh, the basic and main problem will be China's aggressive and you know the Senkaku problem that will remain I think for quite some time and I do not see any early resolution. Uh, coming to Japan and Korea, I think uh, the shadow of history keep on uh, hanging over the you know both the both both the countries that will remain as a kind of historical you know uh, irritant like the periodically uh, apart from uh, what. Uh, uh, I think uh, Bajanti mentioned about the court case, the comfort women issues that keeps on coming along. I think that will that will uh, not derail the you know economy relationship, but then it is a, a kind of irritant. But at the same time, let us not also forget that both Japan and South Korea are very strong allies of America, where the strategic you know interest of US is you know over over uh, over so, uh, with the, like, 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 even, even Japan also has, you know, some, uh, some problem with even Russia also. So each are trying to resolve their, uh, uh, in problems bilaterally. But from the larger, uh, uh, you know, strategic perspective, if we evaluate each country's uh, approach, I think uh, each is trying to resolve in their own way. Uh, uh, underpinning uh, these differences, I think the, uh, the economic content, in 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 each relationship, I think we remained uh, quite strong, and uh, each no no one would like to you know derail that because that will that is going to hit uh, the country which actually takes the first initiative. Uh, the only point is now the the the, the in China has lost a bit of trust of the world because of this uh, issue of the origin and then 
uh, the Trump telling this is, you know, China virus, Pompeo, you know, Pompeo is telling this is a, you know, one virus. Uh, that is going to little, uh, I think, uh, dent the image of China. And those countries which are, uh, which have, have, have the production uh, uh, bases there in China, uh, if they move out en masse, I think that will uh, affect the economic content of, I think, uh, all these countries. And uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, whether uh, India is going to benefit from there, I wish India does. Uh, uh, in, in which case, uh, I think uh, our uh, relationships with uh, both South Korea and Japan uh, are, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think will be a welcome change. And I wish, I think, it, 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 it uh, moves that, uh, that way. But then we need to also resolve our own domestic issues, which will uh, be, you know, attractive to these uh, potential partners to come to us and then create, uh, you know, help the economy to revive. Uh, so I think there are all these things I would like to mention about. And maybe I can go on, but then this is a, <laughs> this is a conference, so I cannot uh, take more time. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Raghu, and thank you, uh, Dr. Panda. Quite true. I mean, you know, we can, there's a lot, to, there's sort of a lot of facets to this entire relationship. And as you have mentioned very correctly that, you know, both um, South Korea and Japan are alliance partners of the U.S. Too, so that is certainly going to be a very, very strong factor in the relationship and the geopolitics of the region. And again, thank you once again very, very much. Really enjoyed this conversation with you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hello. Over to you, John. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the chair, the fellow panelists, and all the participants who have joined uh, for this webinar, and but uh, in, from different parts of the country. And uh, I'd like to thank you all once again. Now I declare the webinar is officially over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye.